Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share our work uh, within the Nam Foundation. Um, I am currently visiting our project in the Comoros, where the internet connection is not really good, so I will turn off my camera. Um, so today um, I will present some uh, experience that we develop uh, jointly with the national health programs where we collaborate leprosy or Hansen's disease and tuberculosis, and also the Institute of Tropical Medicine. Um, in 1954, John Snow demonstrated uh, the essential role of in public health of geographical information system while studying the cholera outbreak in London. Uh, beyond mapping diseases, GIS includes analyzing, managing, and linking data with geographical locations. Variables that can be used and visualized are, for instance, administrative boundaries, including very detailed level of uh, <clears throat> boundaries as household, uh, land use, and also uh, altitude but also relationships between epidemiological variables, et cetera. So uh, GIS uh, allows also analysis of person, time, and space, and makes GIS uh, a powerful epidemiological tool for prevention and control of infectious diseases. Particularly in leprosy or Hansen's disease and tuberculosis, both are infectious diseases that can be cured without complications if diagnosed early. And GIS can help to efficient use of resources in high risk areas, ensuring an important impact at the population level. In the picture, you see um, <clears throat> a person affected by leprosy diagnosed at late state with mutilations in uh, both hands. And uh, the next picture is a person affected by tuberculosis also diagnosed in a late stage with uh, malnutrition and permanent reduced uh, pulmonary capacity. Um, both uh, late diagnosis increase the risk of mortality and favorable treatment outcomes and long life complications. So we intend to use GIS to improve early care and control of both infectious diseases. So here uh, you see uh, the map of the Union of Comores, where I am now. Uh, this is an archipelagic country located in the Indian Ocean, north of Madagascar uh, <clears throat> and east of uh, Mozambique. The estimated population in the Comoros, which, is, uh, which has three islands, is 800,000 population and 50% uh, live in this uh, island, Grand Comor, which is the capital, which is very affected by tuberculosis. According to WHO, the estimate, the estimate annual incidence is uh, around 300, but uh, there is another study, Global Burden of Diseases, that estimated to be uh, 600, 700 cases per year. But in the Comoros, we are diagnosing uh, yearly less than 200 cases, so less than 20% according to the global burden disease estimates or 40% according to the WHO estimates. So we realized that there were uh, the detection issue and we used uh, information about uh, all the tuberculosis patients diagnosed between 2014-2018 we entered the data using ODK and uh, the locations of, uh, of the villages, which, is, uh, which are around 200 villages. And we estimated the number of patients according to the health facilities in this map. And then uh, we wanted to see, uh, to predict uh, using a, an open source uh, software, which is called SatScan, uh, to detect uh, where uh, there is clustering of cases uh, with high incidence, meaning new cases, our transmission is ongoing, but also those with uh, low rates of incidence, so less uh, new cases detected. 
So in the third map, you can see uh, the result of this analysis. And you can see that we identified uh, eight clusters. Only two were uh, significant uh, from the statistical point of view. One was a high incident uh, cluster, meaning that there is a lot of transmission there. And uh, with more than two times risk of having leprosy in the capital, Moroni. But also you can see that there were clusters in, in other health facilities and villages where there was less risk of having tuberculosis. So we wonder if this is really showing the, the reality because we, we can assume that there is uh, probably higher risk in Moroni because this is the capital and there is a lot of population, but we don't, we don't believe that in the other areas there is less risk of leprosy. So we uh, suspected uh, an access to care as an issue and in 2022, we uh, <clears throat> did a survey for pathway uh, analysis, asking the patients where they go when they have symptoms of TB. And we uh, came out to find out that 30% of the patients that are symptomatic for TB, they went to the informal sector, meaning the traditional healers and also the, the nurses that are uh, for private. Uh, for profit, sorry. And then we, we using this, uh, using this uh, approach, we identify these uh, less uh, risk transmission areas to be targeted for improving TB services. Uh, this is another example uh, that, uh, that we are using in the Bangladesh. Bangladesh is one of the most populated countries in the world. Damien Foundation is covering their 33 million population in a leprosy and TB project. Uh, although there, there are only three new leprosy cases per year, the national strategy aims to examine all the contacts of the new leprosy patients. And uh, for the last years, we are not seeing a decrease in the number of, 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 uh, of new cases. So that's why we intend to do an active case finding, meaning door-to-door -door visits using a GPS logger, which is here. This is uh, a device, a small device that weighs uh, less than 20 grams and that records the GPS coordinates. So whenever a patient is diagnosed, we give to him uh, or to her this GPS logger. We ask to keep this uh, GPS logger at their household. And then in the next uh, appointment, uh, the GPS logger is, bring it, is brought back and then we can identify where the patient lives and then to analyze if there is clustering to identify high risk transmission areas. <laughs> and once we download the data and map using quantum GIS, which is an open source uh, software, we can develop uh, a buffer where the households are at high risk and using as another uh, GPS uh, uh, app, which is called GPX Viewer, we can see if we are visiting all the households that are in, within the buffer where there is um, a high risk of transmission. And then we go door to door, we examine all the contacts of new leprosy patients, and we collect the data of uh, the screening results using, again, ODK, which is an open source uh, app for data collection. So as such, we intend to improve uh, the effectiveness of active case, case detection and adapt our strategy to the reality of the country. Another example is uh, currently in the, for leprosy in the Comoros, which uh, the country where, where I am visiting now. So um, you can see here um, that uh, we visited uh, the households in the high endemic villages of the Comoros, which is one of the 23 priority countries uh, for leprosy because of high transmission and high burden. And with the Institute of Tropical Medicine, we visited uh, the households and you can see the yellow white uh, circles are the households of the patients and the blue stars are the new uh, patients diagnosed. And uh, while doing Active, active case finding, we found 
new cases in this is our, those are the yellow stars. So you can see uh, here what, what I want to show is that even in the households that are far from new cases, we found uh, cases, uh, new leprosy cases, meaning that beyond the household of the new cases, you can find you can find cases, meaning that the transmission is really high, and we need them to improve uh, our strategy there by covering the whole population of the villages at high risk. Um, so uh, I illustrated that GIS can help integration of infectious diseases. We use a multi-disease integration because we are using, for instance, is uh, ODK and GPX viewer for other skin neglected tropical diseases. Those are MTDs, leprosy, viruli, ulcer, yolks, etc. But also in other countries, we are using for screening of COVID and TB. Uh, those GP, uh, GIS apps are efficient for control measures and surveillance, especially when there is transmission ongoing. And for leprosy, it's also interesting because we can use digital health apps for diagnosis because leprosy is diagnosed by only clinical examination. So there is no test for confirming diagnosis. Also another potential of uh, GIS is to link with uh, molecular epidemiology, for instance, antimicrobial resistance, which is a huge threat for uh, control of infectious diseases. While implementing GIS in our countries, we face challenges. The, the first one was capacity building for GIS in the countries. There were also confidentiality issues because the patients, uh, they are afraid to share uh, their status of disease because of a stigma. A stigma. And uh, we also uh, faced limited uh, resources for uh, <clears throat> implementing these strategies. And with, with, with this, I, I say thank you. and. We'll happy to, to answer the questions, uh, if any. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Nimo. Um, it was really uh, interesting to see um, this application in the health sector. I think we are going to jump um, towards your presentation, Yorick. Um, as a reminder, Yorick is working at uh, Doctors Without Border as um, GIS um, coordinator. Is it right, Yorick? <laughs> That's right. I'm working as a GIS and MISI maps coordinator, and it's especially uh, about the MISI maps that I wanted to share uh, today with you. Um, I actually gonna start off with uh, some examples immediately, so you can see what it is. So let me share my screen. And, uh, okay. And so, um, so as I said, I'm responsible for uh, missing maps within uh, within MSF. And with missing maps, it's actually a project which uh, uh, which name explains what it is. Uh, because as I'm working for for MSF, so Médecins Sans Frontières and Doctors Without Borders, uh, we are a humanitarian organization working um, in uh, delivering medical aid basically in over seventy countries of the world in over 70 countries of the world, in a lot of, um, not always country-based, but also in a lot of smaller places, villages, towns, uh, on, also on province uh, levels and so on. And it might surprise you, or maybe not for some of you, that um, data, geographical data is still a challenge um, to, um, to, to, yeah, to, our, uh, to our staffers uh, on the ground. Um, what I mean with the geographical data is still a challenge. So this is, for example, uh, the map of Google Maps of a town in the east of uh, the York Sea in South uh, Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, it's called Baraka. It's a pretty big town. Um, you see here on the Google Map, you see a few, uh, a few roads uh, coming through it, the main road, and you also see that there uh, is a hospital. But if I now look at an aerial imagery, a satellite uh, image, you really see that this is a city full of, full of life, constructed, fully, fully constructed, uh, etc. So when uh, when we did, um, so our teams are working in Baraka already for ages, <laughs> for ages, for years. Um, they were supporting the, the Baraka hospital. They have we have mobile teams uh, intervening and in, in, in several outbreaks, measles outbreaks, uh, refugee, etc. 
setting violence, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there was really uh, a lack of understanding about, for example, how many people are living there, how large are the places that we are uh, looking at, what are, where are water points, where people are, are fetching water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we decided to, to get a better map um, and we asked, well, we, we did this through the Missing Maps uh, volunteer group. And this is basically uh, the results from the, the view that you're seeing now from Baraka. So you see all the buildings are now on the map. You see as well all these points uh, that are on the map. So you see the hospital is of course still there, but also other uh, uh, hospitals, dispensaries, uh, health center. You also see the taps on the map uh, for where people are getting water. Um, our offices as well, <laughs> as well on the map and other, all, also other points of interest that are really uh, interesting for, uh, for our teams to, uh, to understand. Uh, so this is after uh, we, got, uh, we got the help of the Missing Maps uh, community. Another example, this is uh, again a Google map of, um, of one of the refugee camps in the east of Chad where there are Sudanese uh, uh, refugees coming into. As well, we are working in these camps to support um, a variety of, of medical uh, issues uh, here. So this is how it looks on, on a Google map and this is how it looks on, on reality. So you see you see a few larger buildings. The image is not that clear for you, but uh, it's, it's rather zoomed out. But you see all these these white uh, blurry gray dots. These are all all uh, all basically um, yeah shelters for refugees to uh, where they are living. So it's a really 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 large area. So after our missing mappers have been uh, coming through to it, we got this as a result. So we basically put whole, they basically put the whole community uh, on the map, which was not yet on the map, uh, on the map before. So this is this is what we what we can do with help of our missing maps uh, volunteers. Because what is missing maps? So missing maps is basically a worldwide uh, project um, where volunteers from around the world are helping us to build these maps. It's basically a three-step pro, uh, process. So in the first step, we have remote volunteers. Remote volunteers like myself, you, uh, my mom, uh, my, <laughs> my younger brother, um, everybody basically who is willing to, to contribute. You can contribute um, basically by logging on on a website and having this satellite image on your, your screen and literally type, start drawing over it to create this actual data that we need to do more analysis and uh, to understand uh, situations. Uh, so that can be done fully remotely. Of course, um, you would have then a nice map, but what makes it uh, more useful is also this local information. So we do work a lot um, with local volunteers as well as with our own uh, our own staff who are collecting these uh, uh, information that is uh, needed to understand and do do more analysis with the data um, to collect this on the ground. So that's step two. So to illustrate, basically, that's what I was referring to in this map. So all these. All these water points they were basically walked through by one of our volunteers um, and collected uh, collected this information to get this actual data that we can then use uh, for the for our operations to support as well of course in this example you see a few of the of the road names so this is as well local information uh, that is often often missing as well of village names um, that's uh, especially in rural areas, you would be surprised they are not digitized. They are in people's heads, they are on paper maps, but they're not digitized in a lot of cases. Um, and then of course, our third step is really using, uh, using the data uh, as a humanitarian organization. We use the data for multiple, multiple, uh, multiple uh, issues, basically. Uh, some examples come very close to what uh, Nimer was showing us. A very interesting, by the way, Nimer. Uh, I will ask you a few more questions afterwards, certainly. Um, but also, uh, just to get roadmaps, how do we get there? How long does it take us to get there? Uh, how many people are, can we reach? How many, um, how many people are we actually trying to reach? How many people are living in these areas? How many, what villages are flooded, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really baseline data that gets created through missing maps that can be used for multiple, uh, multiple purposes. So uh, Missing Maps is not only uh, MSF, um, so we are one of the founding organizations, but it's a close collaboration between all 
uh, different, mostly humanitarian uh, organizations, international NGOs or uh, research institutes as well. Um, so we vary a lot. So there's several uh, Red Cross organizations who are part as well. And we also build a lot on the work of the humanitarian open street map team, who is uh, basically the NGO who is uh, coordinating everything around mapping and uh, um, in the humanitarian uh, humanitarian space of, of open open data, I would say. Um, other organizations are smaller, are large. Um, some are very specialized in map making. Um, you have like an IMAP, a map action, but also an ADF um, or yeah, an IFRC or something. Uh, so uh, collaboration between organizations who are trying to do the same at the same platform and trying to share uh, all data uh, with each other. Um, so a little bit more in detail. So why are we actually doing this the way we are doing this basically? So as I so I said, it's a three step process, but I didn't point out um, maybe in big yet enough that we are contributing with the missing maps to the platform, which is called OpenStreetMap. So it's it's OpenStreetMap.org. It's basically just a website if you would go there um, as a Google Maps. But this website is fully created by uh, volunteers. So it's working a little bit like a Wikipedia, but in, instead of an encyclopedia, this is basically a map where people are contributing to all based on volunteer um, basis. So it's one big database. It's created by volunteers. The thing is also we can, uh, we can do this very fast. So basically, if I would uh, request the community of, of missing maps volunteers, hey, can we map uh, we can we map this because we need the data uh, as soon as possible, then it's possible uh, that they just shoot an action and they get uh, they get for us uh, some mapping done very quickly. Also, the example of uh, that we can decide what we map um, as for example, a Google map that's just an, a commercial company um, that's uh, that's mapping basically areas that are of their interest that are commercial interest. But on this open platform of OpenStreetMap, we can contribute to the areas that we want to, especially uh, the nice example is always the, the refugee camps uh, as an example that you can see here. Things that I did already uh, mention is it's open to use for everybody, it's data that can be used by everybody, also the data is shared between us and the world. And it's also a low cost because we can uh, we can create data with help of volunteers. And then, yeah, the big flag here is um, it's basically communities uh, who are so supporting us. So it's not it's not um, it's not big uh, it's not employers. It's really like volunteer communities who are mapping uh, the places that we are basically requesting, the places that they are working in. Um, and they are basically, as in this example, our heroes, our superheroes, um, to uh, to help us uh, mapping these places in the world um, where there is no data until now. So uh, yeah, handing over back to Philippine, I, I think. Yes. <laughs>